Welcome to The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. This podcast is brought to you by SavingYouTaxes.com and hosted by J. Barry Watts. As an advanced tax strategist and enrolled agent federally licensed by the IRS, Barry is uniquely qualified to go deeper into the Internal Revenue Code than most accountants. He understands and interprets its provisions explaining how they'll help you reduce income taxes you owe so you can direct that previously wasted tax money into tax-free accounts that you can enjoy in your retirement years. Now, on today's episode. Are you sitting on cash, afraid to invest it in the markets during this crazy time in our country? Are you unsure what to do? Well, you're not alone. And today on The Truth About Taxes and Retirement, our host, a veteran of bear markets, bull markets, volatile markets, and turbulent tax times, J. Barry Watts, is going to talk simply about what to do with cash now. Welcome to today's edition of The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. My phone has been ringing off the hook the past couple of weeks with people who wonder what they should do with money right now. And that led me to today's podcast topic, what to do with cash now. But Barry, wait, I mean, come on. Is this really a question? All they have to do is send it to me. That's the one simple answer right there. Well, and I appreciate that uh, as an alternative for diversification purposes. Maybe I will add that to the menu of choice. I like it. Um, <laughs> you know, is it really a question? That's a good question. It is a question because people are calling and asking, should it be a question? Well, maybe not. And we're going to talk about that and how sometimes uh, circumstances cause us to lose our discipline and think differently than maybe we ought to. The reason I think people are asking this question, Patrice, is because we live in very unusual times, times that are so abnormal that they leave people feeling uneasy. And that uneasiness makes people question their own convictions and results in a sense of uncertainty about many things, including what to do with money now. Here's just an example. I met with a client two weeks ago. She's a retired school teacher. He's a retired business owner. They have over a million dollars in their investment accounts and about $350,000 in cash in the bank because cash makes them feel more comfortable. And I get that. Uh, she's got a decent pension from having been a teacher and uh, he's got his, his social security, of course. And so they aren't spending any of their money because they're living out of their pension and social security. Now, their particular accounts are doing great this year. They have grown by 32%. Wow, not bad. That's a, yeah, it's just a stellar return, far above what we should expect uh, and what we built into our assumptions when we designed their investment strategy. So everything is going gangbusters for them financially. Personally, they're doing well. The kids are all good. Their health is good. Uh, their grandson just signed to play NCAA Division One baseball and probably will make it to the majors. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, their yeah. life is just really good. And at the end of our conversation, after we'd gone through everything, showed her how our accounts were performing and, and offered to get them more income if they needed it, which they didn't need. At the end of the whole conversation, she looked at me and she said, everything is going really well. Why do I feel so uneasy? Mm -hmm. Now, I believe I know the reason, but Patrice, let's put you on the hot seat for a moment. Why do you think this lady felt uneasy? Well, I think you mentioned it. These are uncertain times. Things are so different and turbulent. Maybe she just doesn't know what's coming down the pike. None of us do. I, you know, we all wake up listening to today's news and the latest craziness, and, and I think it puts uneasiness in all of us. I think she's uneasy in her case because she's paying attention. She's paying attention. Oh, 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 oh. She's paying too much attention. Well, no, no, I don't even mean too much attention. I just mean she's paying attention. These are upsetting times. Think about it, Patrice. You and I will get this. Many of our listeners won't uh, because you and I are on the older side of the scale, perhaps. But there's more upheaval in America than we have seen any time since the period maybe 1962 through 1974. Okay. And, and you and I recall what a turbulent time that was. I was a kid mm -hmm. growing up. You were just a little bit ahead of me at that moment. But the, it really started with the Kennedy assassination. And then there was the civil rights movement and the marches on Selma and all the black, white violence or white, black violence, whatever it was, and, and the murder of Martin Luther King. And that all was set against the backdrop of the larger Vietnam War. Uh, and that just split the country. Split oh, the country. it did split the country. And, and you know, we, I mean, we graduated 
graduate boys from high school on Friday night and we ship them out on Monday morning kind of thing. What an ominous sort of time. Every night on the evening news, there's a count put on the TV screen of how many American soldiers had died that day. And then you may remember there was the second Kennedy assassination. Some people don't really realize there were two brothers who got killed there in the 1960s. And that all was followed by the Arab oil embargo and gas shortages and wage and price controls. Can you imagine the president of the United States locking down prices and wages? It sounds pretty crazy, but maybe not. It certainly happened back then. Uh, and, and that kind of government overreach exists even today. Uh, it was during this same period, Patrice, that Richard Nixon devalued the dollar by taking the U.S. off of the gold standard. It used to be there was a dollar's worth of gold in Fort Knox and the Federal Reserve Banks for every dollar in circulation. But as you know, it's not that way today anymore. So that was a turbulent time. You remember. I remember standing in the gas lines with a car waiting. Was, was it the odd or even night license plates? You could get gasoline if the station still had gas by the time you got to the pump. Yeah, and I guess if you were there on an odd day because you were an odd plate and they ran out of gas that day, the next day was an even day. So you just were stuck until the next day. That's right. So you had been kind of like a person today in a traffic jam with an electric car. Same kind of problem. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just had to put that in there. <laughs> hey, Patrice, do you remember what happened in, during that period that was so big politically? We had the Watergate break in and the cover up that Nixon knew about and said was OK. And it led to Nixon's resignation. Yes. There was this rise. This is interesting because times are, are kind of similar today. There was a far right political faction called the John Birch Society that rose up in prominence. Mm -hmm. I remember my dad buying gold and silver. I remember dad picking me up at school one day and taking me out of class early. I was in the fourth grade and he took me away to butcher a hog. He still had, okay. or he still has today, the single shot 22 rifle that he used to kill that hog. And after he killed her, I remember it. I was in the fourth grade. It's a big deal to watch all this go down. He hoisted that hog up onto the rafters of the barn with a chain hoist. And he skinned it oh. and he gutted it and he quartered it and he took it home and he processed it in the basement. Why? Because times were tumultuous and it was going to get to where we weren't going to be able to buy meat. So we needed to learn to process our own. So, Patrice, that's what you and I grew up in. And I'd submit to you that we really are in a time of similar upheaval in America today. And I think that upheaval falls into three different categories that I want to talk to you about. The first of those categories is social. <clears throat> the, the three categories are social, political, and economic. So let's look at those and how they fit. Social categories. So first of all, can you believe some high schools in America no longer have separate restrooms for boys and girls? I'm sorry. I, you know, be however woke you want to be. That's just freaking ridiculous. It's just insane. Uh, in fact, can you believe that we now in America issue passports uh, for male or female or neither people who aren't sure which one they are? That's ridiculous. Right. I, That's right. I, one of the first lessons that my grandma Geraldine taught me out back of the Little Rock House at the end of the Y Bridge next to the country store in Galena, Missouri, was when I was a little bitty boy and I asked her how she knew which ones of the puppies were boys and which ones were girls. And so she rolled a pup over and she explained to me the anatomy of boy puppies and girl puppies. So the fact that today we've lost track of uh, whether men are men and women are women is just absurdly unthinkable. And now our kids are being taught that his and hers are no longer acceptable. We must use terms like G. <laughs> and we must ask people what their preferred pronoun is. That's how crazy it has become socially in America. So I think that creates a, a sense of uneasiness in people. But it's not just the social craziness. There's the political craziness. Can you believe in America that your grandchildren are wearing masks in school and their parents are losing their jobs for being unvaccinated while 37,000 Afghan refugees were resettled into the United States with no COVID test and no vaccines. And meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants are coming across the southern border and mixing into society with no COVID tests, no max, masks, no vaccines. We're actually in America having votes to defund the police. 
in, in Minneapolis, it was to dismantle the police department and replace it with social workers. I was in Minneapolis just a couple of weeks before that vote. And I talked to a police officer about it and asked him, you know, how's this vote going to go? And they didn't know. Now, it happened that, as it turned out, the Minneapolis citizens had good sense and they decided it was a good idea to keep the police. And I certainly think it's a good idea because I don't know about you, but when a drug crazed, angry guy with no regard for fellow human beings is swinging a gun around, I really want some guy with a gun to take mm-hmm. him out rather than a psychologist just trying to talk to him about getting in touch with his feelings. These are crazy, (laughs) unsettling times. So let's look at the economic issues that we face. In the Great Recession, which happened from December 2007 through June of 2009, we saw the Federal Reserve drive interest rates to zero. Now, all of our lives, interest rates have been normal at five or six or seven or 8%. There've been a few times they got up over 10%, but five, six, seven, eight, that's just mm-hmm. normal interest rates. But for the past dozen years in America, zero and 1% and maybe 2% have been the norm. I have friends. In fact, I just realized I'm going to be seeing him in a couple of hours uh, at lunch. I have friends who have a 30 year home loan at 2% interest. <laughs> I, I need yes. to, if I could get a 30 year home loan at 2% interest, man, I need to go borrow as much as I possibly can. Think of that's it. Well, that, it, yeah, that is, a, that is a pretty good strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, think about it though, from a retiree's perspective, people aren't drawing a check. How's a retiree sp- supposed to generate income safely in retirement when interest rates basically don't exist anymore? It's economic unsettling, unsettlement. Then there's the printing of money between December 19, I'm sorry, December 2019 and August of 2021, the United States money supply increased by 35%. That's over 5 trillion new dollars. When that kind of money is printed, it makes your dollar worth 35% less because your dollar has to compete with all of those new dollars that just got created. And then what's the government doing with that money? Well, they're giving a lot of it away, literally mailing it to people. Now, who doesn't like to get free money? But some of that free money, when it hits, it gets spent, but ultimately it gets invested because it's going to go to the merchant and go to the person up line from the merchant, the manufacturer. And somewhere when that money lands, it has to be invested. And there are only two ways you can invest it. You can loan it in the form of a bond. And what are interest rates? Zero percent. Yeah. Or the only other option is you can own something with it. That means the money gets dumped into the stock market. So you own stocks in companies or you own a mutual fund that owns stocks in company companies because there's no other place for the money to go. And so here's been the result of that in terms of looking at the markets. In the eight years that Obama was the president, the United States stock market surged by 170, I'm sorry, 147%. 147%. And, you know, the, Obama was president when we started the shovel ready jobs and the whole process of uh, taking interest rates down to zero. Now, he was followed by Trump. During the four years of Trump, we added another 51% to the stock market. And in the first 11 months of Biden, the market has increased 19%. So that's 220% roughly over the past uh, three presidents. There's no place for money to go but to the stock market, and all that free additional money being printed and released is driving the markets wild. We haven't had a significant drawdown, a significant negative year in the stock market in 13 years, and thinking people are concerned. They look at it and say, wow, this thing is on fire, and at some point it's going to get so hot that it's going to really burn down. We're going to have a crash, and I'm scared. And that's why they call me up and say, what should I do with money now? Because they're making a pretty reasonable assumption as they look at the culture, the society, the politics, and the economics, and they say, I, maybe I ought to just keep my money in a mattress. Well, let's talk about that for just a moment. Think about that, keeping your money in a mattress. Maybe not the best idea because of what inflation does to us. 
And so, Do people really understand inflation? Barry? No, I don't think people understand any of this because they're busy going to soccer games, raising their kids, paying their bills, living their life, retiring, going fishing, hiking, hunting, whatever it is that they do in their retirement, enjoying their walks on the beach. Nobody wants to get up every day and face these battles. This is what but somebody is. Well, some of these people are. They're paying attention. Oh, the, well, some of them aren't. Some of them are. They're, they've got the information, but they don't know what to do with the information. And because they don't know what to do with the information, the problem is that it, it, this uncertainty and this unease causes us to make bad financial decisions. And one of the bad financial decisions can be to paralyze us from making any financial decisions at all. You see, the fact is we have to move forward financially because the economy is moving forward. The markets are moving forward. Inflation is moving forward. Tax rates are moving forward. We cannot allow unease and uncertainty to paralyze us. So what do we do with cash now? Well, think with me for a moment about inflation, if you don't mind. Now, the most recent numbers to come from the federal government, if you can trust numbers coming from the federal government, and I think that's a legitimate question. The most recent numbers say inflation is running at 6.2% annually. That means it costs you 6% more to live this year than it did last year. But if you go to the grocery store or the gas station, it sure seems like the cost of living is rising more rapidly than that, doesn't it? And in fact, there was just a report that companies are setting aside 4% raises for the coming year, but 4% in a raise is not 6% in inflation. Yeah. If you you really have 6% inflation, you get a 4% raise. Congratulations. You're 2% in the hole. Yeah, exactly. And that really, that's the really large message everywhere. Now, here, here's some things to consider or just to know interesting information about how the government calculates inflation. There are two main drivers, number one, housing, and number two, medical costs. And interestingly, inflation for medical costs is flat right now. And there's two reasons for that, stents and statins. We're seeing less open heart surgeries because statins have treated the problem of high cholesterol. And when an artery is clogged, instead of cutting you open and replumbing your heart with it, we're running up inside the, the vein or the artery, and we're putting in a little metal stent, a mesh stent to open that artery back up. That's become the treatment of choice instead of open heart surgery. Huh. So think about it. You can have a stent put in in the morning. You can, you can go home that afternoon. But if you have open heart surgery, it's a much bigger deal. It requires more nursing care, overnight stays in the hospital, more use of medical resources. So there's actually been a decline in the demand for those medical resources, meaning there are more hospital rooms and operating rooms and medical staff available for other procedures. And so when the demand declines like that, then prices decline. And that's why medical costs are currently not inflating, surprisingly enough. Yeah. But now the other major component of how the government calculates inflation is housing. And that's a whole nother story. Normally, 3 to 4% per year is the inflation rate on housing. Across the country right now, it's averaging better than 20%. Right. So you had a 20% rise in the cost of housing to bacon and unleaded, <laughs> and the average person in America is paying a lot more to live this year than they did last year. Now, here's the numeric impact for the average person. If you're making 50000 bucks a year, next year it's going to take $53,000 a year just to keep even. If you're making 100000 this year, well, next year you've got to make 106000 to keep up. If you make 250000 a year, you've got to make 265000 the next year just to keep up. Now, that may seem simple enough, particularly when there's only one room in the math or one, one year in the math. But think about when there are 20 years in the math at those rates of inflation, inflation, I can't talk today, at those rates of inflation, $50,000 today in 20 years will be $160,000. Do you ever dream you'd have to make $160,000 a year? Or, or if you're three retired times. and- Yeah, that's three times your original salary there. Yeah, three times where you started. And, and you're probably going to retire in that 20-year period of time. <laughs> so if, if you retired thinking, well, I just need to make what I make now, this $50,000 number. Well, no, you need to make $160,000 by then. If you're making $100,000 today, it's going to be $320,000 then in 20 years. $250,000 today, you need $800,000 in 20 years just to keep up a little over three times. And that leads me to say, if you're not scared, you're not paying attention. Now, let's consider for a moment rates of return. The compound annual growth rate of the S&P 500 cash price index for the past 20 years, ending 
December 31st, 2020. So a 20-year period of time at the first of this century, the compound annual growth rate of the S&P 500 cash price index is 5.37%, 5.3% every year on average. But let's be generous and let's call it 6% just for a little interesting math. So if you earn 6% and you're in the 30% tax bracket, let's say 25% federal and 50% state, and let's round that up to a full third instead of 30%, let's call it, you know, did I say 50% state? Well, you know, New York, California. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so if you earn 6%, you're in the 30% tax bracket, 25% federal and 5% state. And let's just round that up and let's make it 33% because that's an even third. So it's simple in our math. If you're earning 6% and a third of it goes to taxes, you've got 4% left. Now let's subtract inflation of 6%. Your purchasing power just went down. It decreased. You have a negative 2% this year. And that means that in 20 years, you're only going to have about 60% of the buying capacity that you have today. That's almost cutting it in half. Now, imagine reducing your lifestyle by half over the next 20 years. You know, many of us have got a little room to cut back, but half? You can't take your money. Here's the big message, Patrice. You can't take your money and hide it. You have to stay in the game. You have to stay invested. You can't leave your $350,000 sitting in the bank at 0.6% interest. Well, that's what we're going to talk about as we begin to bring the podcast into the final approach to the airport here. So let's talk about the three people who called me. Uh, to bring these questions up and ask me what they should do with cash right now. The first was a guy in his late fifties. He doesn't have much money. Uh, he's a friend of mine, actually a guy I know from out uh, near the farm and he knew what I did for a living. So one day the phone rings and it's him. He's on my cell phone. I'm, I'm like, who the heck's on my cell phone? Cause I don't just give that number to everybody, you know? Well, it was this guy and he had, his dad died. I knew his dad had died back, oh, sometime in November. And so he suddenly has a modest amount of money. And he called and he wanted to know what he should do with it. Now, the second guy who called me was a retired grandpa with a brand new baby granddaughter, his first. And he said, I want to give 15000 this year and 15000 next year. I was thinking about one of those 529 plan things. But I want to know how should we invest this? What should we do to make it grow? Well, I'm not necessarily a big fan of 529s, and we'll talk about that later, perhaps, about why that might not be the best idea. One of the big things coming into play here is, do you think 20 years from now, the college situation will be the same as it is today or even further different than it was when you went to school? You know, I, I can't believe what college was like. Of course, I went 40 years ago now. But the fact is, the notion of graduating high school, going to college, spending four years, living in a dorm, uh, buying textbooks, going to class, that's, that's done. That's done. I don't know what they're going to do with those college facilities. But the world of education has changed. And so I said to him, do we really want to put this money in a 529 plan that is designed structurally, according to the law, to be spent in that way when your granddaughter may choose a whole different path? to get her education. He said, I'm all about it. I totally understand what he's talking about. What are we going to do instead? And we're on a plan to talk about those things. And the third guy who called me, he was kind of interesting. It was actually a couple in their mid forties. They've sold their business and they're walking away with about 5 million bucks. So that's a real nice payday when you're in your mid forties. So here's the guidance that I would give to all of these people. It's very similar guidance, even though one of them's got a few thousand dollars and one of them's got $5 million. The guidance is simply first this, invest, invest, but do it smartly. Only invest when the markets are in demand. When the markets shift to oversupply, get out. And as you do invest, only invest in sectors of the market that are in greater demand than the overall market itself is on average. Now, here's the way this works. There are 11 different sectors of the S&P 500. They are technology, healthcare, financial, consumer discretionary. That's big ticket items. Notice the word discretionary. It means you could do it, but you might not do it. Big things like televisions and vacations. Then there's communication and there's industrial companies and there are consumer staples 
not discretionary, but these are the things you have to have. For example, toilet paper, soap, toothpaste, none of those are discretionary. Those are required items. Just think about all the things Procter & Gamble makes. Those are almost consumer staples. Pretty good strategy, by the way, to build your company, providing nothing but the staples that people have to have. Energy, utilities, real estate, and materials like aluminum and wood pulp and steel, the things that are used to build things, that rounds out the 11 different sectors of the stock market. Now, if the market is in demand overall, you want to be in the market. You want to be invested. If the market is in supply, you want to be out of the market. You want to be in cash or perhaps over into bonds or something different. And if the market is in demand, you want to be in but you only want to be in those sectors that are in greater demand than the overall market itself. So at this exact moment today, which warning, pay attention, will be different by the time most people are listening to this podcast. Today, if we were doing it, you'd only want to be in technology, energy, consumer cyclicals, and real estate. So that's what I'd buy today. But, but don't rush out and do that because those sectors will be totally different by the time you hear the podcast, and that won't necessarily be the recipe at that time. And so you might say to me, well, Barry, how do we know what's in demand? How do we know? Not just how do we, not just how do we know, how do we watch this? Is it every day I've got to sit down and, and put up my little screens and say, oh, my gosh, look at this, look at this, look at this candlestick. Well, but how, but how would you even know what you're seeing on the little screens that represents demand? So that's a really great question. You, there's really only two ways to do this. You can either go buy the research and learn to interpret the research, and I've been doing this for 27 years, learning to interpret the research, or you can work with an advisor who has the research and who already knows how to interpret it. Those are your only two choices. And we have that information and know how to interpret it at our investment advisory firm. We know what to do with it. And while I'm regulatorily prohibited from quoting you performance numbers on this podcast, I'll simply say that I'm confident that you'd be very pleased with your performance if you followed a strategy that was built on this idea of only investing when there's demand in the market and only investing in the things that are in greater demand than the market. So the first general rule I want to give everybody is don't let all the turmoil, the turbulence, the upset cause you to get fractious and say, well, I just think I'll wait a while. What are you going to wait on? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I think I may wait till after the election. Well, which election would that be? The primaries or the general? Is it going to be the next congressional election, 22? Or are you going to go ahead and wait until 24 and see if we get a new president? Hey, that's two more years of your life. You don't have that much longer to live. You don't have any choice. You have to be invested. But you've got to have a sound, sane way of investing. And I believe the best way is based on demand, whether the markets are in supply and demand. Now, Here's the second thing that you got to do. Keep paying attention to taxes. Patrice, did you know that Section 1202 of the Internal Revenue Code, I'm sure you've read it's that. It's upstairs in, the past in my, days, my bedroom. Yeah. 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 Yes, you I have do. that beside your bed on your nightstand. Just you know, you read the no, Internal it Revenue Code. Up the you try to go to sleep, you know. Yeah. Even CPAs, as weird as they are, they don't even have the Internal Revenue Code on their nightstand, you know. Sorry if you're a CPA listening, but you know I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Section 1202 of the Internal Revenue Code is referred to as the Small Business Stock Gains Exclusion. It allows business owners to sell their company as long as they acquired it after September 27, 2010, and avoid capital gains on the first $10 million. How would you like to sell your company for $10 million and pay no capital that is gains awesome. on it, no tax? It is awesome. It is awesome. And business owners don't know about it. In fact, I, I talk to business owners every day who are selling their businesses, who have no idea this is possible. And most of them are already too far down the road to elect this. They haven't got their business set up to do this. So you need to be setting your business up today to do this so that when you sell it in five years or 10 years or 15 years, then you will have set it up properly today so that that will be what takes place. Because if the laws should change, this will be grandfathered in, but you can't trust that, well, I'll do it just a few months before I sell. Now, there are some rules you have to follow, but it's fairly easy to do. And, and this deal is permanent. Uh, the Protecting Americans from Tax Hike Act called PATH. It was passed in 2015, signed by President Obama. It made this a permanent tax break for business owners. That's something that every business owner no. should definitely be aware of, or their financial advisor should be aware of it. 
Well, and I'll just tell you, financial advisors don't know about this. Uh, and, and a lot of CPAs don't know about this. Um, the lady who actually does my books, you know, we own a tax consulting firm. We actually own a firm that also does, um, uh, does tax compliance work. But for reasons that you'll understand, if you'll stop and think about it, I actually take my own personal tax compliance work outside of our firm to be prepared somewhere else. Person who does that work for me did not know, did not know about this particular section of the tax code. Now, you may or may not be able to avoid $10 million in capital gains. You may not even have $10 million in capital gains, but we routinely see people reduce their taxes by $20,000, $50,000, dollars this year and next year and the next year, all because they pay attention and they learn the tax rules. Now, there's a first thing to do is stay invested. Second thing to do is pay attention to taxes. And the third thing to do, Keep pursuing tax-free income. Fund those Roth IRAs to the max. Develop a calculated IRA to Roth conversion strategy and follow it to the T and cleanse that IRA of taxes. Here's an example of somebody who, uh, who was doing that and then wanted to quit. I got a phone call this week from a client and he was fussing because his Medicare premium had gone up by something like $98. And Barry, I'm, I'm having to pay $98 a month to Medicare, and I'm irritated by this. Well, part of the reason he was having to do that is his income is so high. And the reason his income is so high is because we've been taking money out of his IRAs and converting it to Roth. So someday we're going to get to a point where he won't have a high income at all. In fact, he won't have any income that shows up taxably because all of his income is coming out of his Roth. And then he won't have any tax to be paid on his Social Security. He'll be in the 0% tax bracket. And then his Medicare premium will be the lowest possible. But right now, while we're in the transition, he's bothered that he's paying 98 bucks a month. He's got to bite the bullet. <laughs> well, it's a very small bullet. If you can, it's like having, <laughs> it's yes, like having yes. a celery seed caught between your teeth. So my point is, this is not a big deal. It's not a big deal. So you need to be pursuing tax-free income as he is, funding your Roth IRAs, converting IRAs over to Roth IRAs, put $58,000 a year if you qualify into the mega backdoor Roth IRA. And everybody qualifies for a backdoor Roth. You may or may not be able to qualify for the mega backdoor Roth, but you all qualify for the backdoor Roth. By all means, be sure you're funding a private insured retirement advantage account that allows you to make unlimited contributions of any amount to a Section 7702 tax-free retirement program and create a pension for yourself that is extremely unlikely to ever be taxed by the government. So the third thing you need to do is pursue tax-free income. So let's go over them again. Number one, invest, stay invested, use a proper discipline. And the proper discipline for you is to always invest according to when the markets are in demand, and according to what segments of the markets are in demand. Number two, don't take your eye off the tax ball because it's very important to manage the taxes. And number three, keep doing as much as you can to get down there into bucket number three, as we call it, the tax-free bucket. Keep pursuing tax-free income. So it's don't get distracted. Pay attention. Keep your nose to the grindstone. Don't worry about the politics, the markets, the social upheaval. You are right. We've been through some pretty rough times in this country. Every time you start to go through something new, it's, it's the new, oh, big thing. Oh, my gosh, we're going to hell in a handbasket. But we've been through here before. and We've come through. So we're going to make it through? You know, Patrice, it does feel like we're going to hell in a handbasket. Literally, <laughs> literally. And I have to tell you, as I sat down and began penciling out what I wanted to talk about in this podcast and just thinking about it, it did comfort me when I went back through that exercise of the 60s and 70s and said, man, look at what was going on then. I was a kid. You know, I mean, I was born, I was, Kennedy was killed like three months after I was born. So I don't remember that Kennedy death. I do remember the death of his brother, which happened in 68. As I thought about all those things that had happened, I certainly remember the Nixon uh, resignation. I have Nixon's autograph, in fact. Uh, just an interesting thing, because I wrote him a letter. I was like in fourth grade, and I wrote the letter to the president of the United States and asked him for his autograph, and he sent me one. Isn't that interesting? Nice. <laughs> Hang on to it. When you live in the Ozark Hills, you got to do something to make your summertime pass. <laughs> so, so it comforted me 
to know that we have been here before. And while I'm very alarmed and concerned about how we're handling things, I have to believe that we will somehow come out on the other side of this, because if I didn't believe that, then we might as well cash it all in now and just be done. And I'm not willing to do that. I'm not that fatalistic and I don't think it's the right thing to do. So what I'm saying, Patrice, to our listeners is be steady, continue with your long-term focus, be smart, stay invested, get good advice, love your spouse, rock your grandbabies, cast your vote. Go to the ice cream social, stand for the flag when it passes, say the Pledge of Allegiance, say your prayers, and live your life. You control what you can control, and you refuse to be distracted by the rest of it, which is all noise. And if you need help in identifying tax strategies appropriate for you and in learning how to invest using the demand-driven approach that we talk about, well, don't hesitate to call our office. Just go to the website, www.savingyoutaxes.com, and there you'll find a phone number, and you can call us, and the person who answers the phone will schedule a time for you to talk with me personally. Together, we'll figure out whether and how we can help you legally, ethically, and morally take advantage of tax provisions in the tax code and learn how to invest only when it's time to be in the market and only in the sectors of the market that are in highest demand. Until next time, here on The Truth About Taxes and Retirement, I'm Barry Watts, tax strategist and retirement designer for American Tax Strategies, LLC, on the web at savingyoutaxes.com and Wealthcare Investment Advisors, LLC, reminding you that no matter how diligent you are in managing your money, if you don't get the taxes right, nothing else matters. And now for the legal stuff. Remember, past performance is no guarantee of future results. All investment involves risk. The opinions offered today are not intended to replace consultation with your legal tax, and financial counselors. Investment advisory services are offered through Wealthcare LLC Investment Advisors. Tax and insurance consulting is provided by American Tax Strategies, LLC, found on the web at www.savingyoutaxes.com. Thank you for listening to The Truth About Taxes and Retirement Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of SavingYouTaxes.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax and investment advice. Always seek the advice of your own qualified advisor with any questions you may have regarding taxes and investing.